There was a person a long, long time ago who came into a world that was a warring world, where people's rights were being trampled, where people's lives were seen as disposable. And the message that this person gave us is that life is important. Humans are God's gift. And when they asked him who he was, he said, I am the light of the world. And this light that we write this morning, the light that we share this morning is a light for peace. Peace to all lives. Peace in warring times. Peace where there's no bullying. Where we live our lives free and open and caring. The light of Christ, the light of peace, in the whole world. Let us take a moment of silence as we remember. is gleaming, spreading its arms throughout the night, living in the light. Come share its gladness, God's radiant love is burning bright, living in the light. One announcement but I forgot. Uh, and that if you, when you go out, you might have already seen it, but as you go into our, um, the um, parlor, if you look above, there's a hanging of uh, a beautiful hanging. And uh, thank you to Gina for uh, having that created and placed out there. So please take a look. It's quite beautiful. Let us join in the call to worship. Something drew us together this morning. Some holy mystery we call God. Some indescribable hope we feel when we gather in the spirit. Let us lift our voices when morning gilds the skies. Christ be praised when 
I invite you to join with me in the prayer of approach. O oh God, you are beyond words and description. Your love is beyond knowledge and explanation. Make our hearts ready to receive you. Change us, we pray, that our lives may reflect the wonder of your transfiguration. We rejoice in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And with Jesus we share in this ancient prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now this time we'll have the reading of our psalm, which is Psalm 99. Answered them. Proclaim the greatness of God and worship on God's holy hill. And at this time, we'll have our next hymn, which is um, I Can Feel You Near Me, God. And we'll sing verse one of this hymn, and then I'll have a chit-chat, and then we'll sing the second verse of this hymn. I see someone jumping. Good. What's that? I still got so low from the sun. Oh, is that? <laughs> Just to make you feel comfortable. <laughs> 
Well, you know something? If I took these things off, I could still see fairly well way off. But I couldn't read this. Um, there's a time when I didn't wear glasses. So I'm just wondering, why do we wear glasses? Anybody know? Yes. Pardon? To help me see better, that's right. That's right. And sometimes we are nearsighted, which means we're, we can't see far away, I think, and farsighted that we can't see up close. So, yeah, so it helps us see things more clearly. It took me a long time to realize that glasses were good, but now I love them. But you know what? I have many glasses. You know, you know how many glasses I have? I have a lot. I have these glasses because when I'm up front or reading, I can read. And even when I have them on, I make mistakes, right? <laughs> and I have, it's a sunny day out there. What do you think I wear outside? Some sunglasses, that's right. So I have my sunglasses. Now, a lot of what I do, I'm in front of the computer a lot. You ever have a computer? Do you have computers that you're in front of? Yeah? Computers? Do you work on your computer? So I have computer glasses. That's right. Now, some of you might know that I enjoy woodworking around machines and that. I'm lucky thus far. And guess what I wear when I'm doing stuff around machines? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Safety glasses, that's right, so I have safety glasses. Now, sometimes when I'm doing something really close, I have a, a gla a, one glass, a big one with a light on it, that I bring down. What do you call those, do you think? Or sometimes, I tell you, maybe this might be easier. When I was a little fella, many years ago, a lot of the fun that I got in trouble, by the way, and don't do this, I took this glass and I focused it on the sun and caught grass on fire. Yeah, don't do it. Get in trouble. What type of... That mag that's right, a, a, uh, what do they call it? Magnifying glass. But that was close, right? We're right? We were right there. That's right, a magnifying glass. That when I'm doing work, I can look down and really get close and that sort of stuff. Usually when I have splinters in my hand, <laughs> when I'm trying to get them out, I do that. So I have a lot of glasses that I use this, that does different things for me. Now, when we read our story a little later on, we're going to talk about Jesus and his friends going up way up on a mountain. And all of a sudden, the disciples are looking and something happens. And we don't understand what happened, but it was like Jesus was transformed or Jesus changed. And I was thinking about that this week. How we see things differently. It's like putting on a different type of glasses. And I think that when we meet people, we sometimes think, oh, that's who they are. And yet when we get to know them, we see a lot of really neat and cool things about people. And I think when the disciples were up top, they said, oh, that's just Jesus hanging out on the mountain, doing that stuff. And then something happened that they saw a different part of Jesus. And said, oh my gosh, I've never seen that. Isn't that cool? 
and getting back to sometimes when we meet people. You ever meet people and say, yeah, I don't think I like that person. First time we meet them. You ever think that? Yep. I have. And then when I get to know them, it's like putting on a new pair of glasses. I think, you know what? My first lenses, my first glasses seemed that they weren't really correct. And when I magnified and really got close to those people and learned about all about their lives, I saw some really good stuff. And I think as we think about our story today, as we think about Jesus, as we think about, as we look at God, look at Jesus, look at each other, let's make sure that we see the best that people are. Okay? You want to have a prayer? Will you pray with me? Hi, God. Gosh, it's beautiful today. The sun is shining. And the sun is glistening on the snow. It's cool. It's good to be here, God. May we see you May we love you, and may we love everyone. Talk to you later, God. Amen. for reminding me. Yeah, we should have had everybody up doing a little cardio. As you are keenly aware, the needs of our world is really too numerous to name. Shelter, food, clean air, water. Our gifts touch those needs. But the biggest gift we can give is to love the world so much that we give ourselves. Nothing will transform or change need more than our sacrificial love. So as we place money in our offering plates, as we give through par or e-transfer, however we want to give, we give today, we give in a sense of love and a care for all. May God now bless our hopes and our dreams, both in our giving and in our doing. Your morning offering will now be presented. Us pray. Bless these gifts, we pray. May they represent just the beginning of our journey to show forth your glory to the world. Amen.
scripture we're reading this morning is from Exodus, chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of the Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. A reading from the storyteller that we've come to know as Luke, and I'm going to be sharing um, chapter 9, verses 28 to 42, the first part of 40, or 43, rather. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to a mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing, well, they became dazzling white. And suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came that voice, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days. They told no one any of the things that had taken place. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, the crowd met him. Just then, the man from the crowd shouted, Teacher! Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only son. Suddenly a spirit seizes, seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. He convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mulls him until him and will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bear with you? Bring your son here. And while he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all, all were astonished at the greatness of God. May these stories and may these expressions of faith and understanding of God, the lenses, different lenses of seeing God, may they find and inform our lives as people of the way. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our hope, and salvation. Amen. How do we determine what is real? How do we determine what's not real? As humans, we rely upon our sensories, rely upon our senses. I know that this pulpit is real because I can feel it. I can see it. And I guess for you could say, if I knock it, I can hear it as well. But we rely upon our senses to understand the world by our taste, by our touch, smell, and our hearing. Those are ways in which the radar into the world around us brings those messages back to us and says to us, is this real or if it's not real? Reality is determined by and limited to our five physical senses. What you see is what you get. I think we've said that, or we've probably heard it, is probably the standard. If it cannot be seen, tasted, touched, smelled, or heard, then it's not real, or at least in the physical world. We tend to live with the veil that separates the world of the tangible, the measurable, the rational information from that of, dare I say, the other world, the inner world of mystery, transformation, and encounter. And it's always iffy business to venture out into this unveiled type world. There are moments, however, when that veil is parted And we stand in what the Celtic tradition calls a thin place. A thin place. We treat it as suspended, non-verifiable. Places that describe the veil being parted between this world and the other world, between earth and heaven, between the divine and the human, between matter and spirit, between the eternal and the temporal in thin places where none of our senses seem to work as we often is where we often meet the holy the unexpected and maybe the suspect for many of us this is truly uncharted waters We often limit our world and our experience to the five senses, to what we understand, because we trust. It's like trusted friends. This is what we understand. This is how we understand it. To what we can verify. To what we can explain and make sense to us. Thin places, however, invite us to step outside our five senses to step outside what we know, to step outside what we understand and what we can explain. I think you can appreciate the risks that we take when we dare to give expression to those thin places. And we all have probably, if we've dared to do that, endured the looks or the stares or the puzzlement or somehow that we're crazy. However, thin places invite us, I think, to be astonished by the wonder and mystery of the presence, however we name that. To enter the tremendous mystery of God's presence and of God's love. And in these thin places, I think we become overshadowed by the holy, by the spirit, that we can't get a grasp on, that we can't really define, that we can't nail down, but it's forever moving. I 
I remember quite keenly when our sons were born and I was able to hold them in my arms. I saw their wrinkled skin. I heard their cry, felt their weight in my hands, but there's more there than I could see or I could hear or I could touch. I entered into the mystery of life and creation in a way that I had never experienced before. I was standing at that moment in a thin place. That encounter, that thin place, was as real and as present as the cries of a child. As real as the wrinkled skin, as real as the weight in my arms, the veil had been parted or pulled back as I stood in that thin place where I encountered the mystery of love and the union like I've never experienced before. At the tender age of 15 years, I experienced my first death of a loved one. I remember coming home from the funeral and going to my room feeling completely and totally overcome with, with such grief that the tears simply would not stop. I sobbed uncontrollably as I buried my head in the pillow as if my world was coming unhinged. Then in the midst of that turmoil and that pain and that frustration and all that energy that was consuming me, something happened. It defied all my senses. And I can't make sense of it even today. It was so strange, so out of the way, that it wasn't until many years after the fact that I would even dare share the story with people. I still do not understand what happened there, but in the deepest moment of that grief and that, that despair, there was a presence, and without words, there was a communication that said, all is fine, all is okay. The veil had been parted, and I stood in that thin place in that thin moment where earth and heaven seemed to smack together and rub together. And the mystery of love, the mystery of union, I experienced then like I have never experienced before. These thin moments, and you have those thin moments as well, and maybe like yourself, you say, oh, I'm not going to share those things with anyone because they're not verifiable. I can't touch them, feel them, smell them. They go against all the senses that says it's real. But these thin moments, moments that define, defy all of our senses, take us to a thin place where we encounter the mystery of life, the mystery of hope, the mystery of resurrection that we don't fully understand. These thin moments, for me, changed my life and continues to sustain me. From moments of seeing life being born to moments of seeing life ended in the midst of both those extremes. There was a presence and an experience, a thin moment that made sense, that gave hope to these times. In my experience, thin places do that to us. They transform our lives. The veil parts and we know ourselves somehow have come from that, not with great explanation and understanding, but knowing that something has definitely changed within our lives and we are different people. We've been transformed. We and the whole world now stand in a different light. We are oriented to the world and to people and, and, and to the experiences in a different way a way that we really can't understand. 
I wonder if this is what happened to Peter and James and John. Jesus led them to a thin place, a place where human ears could hear God's voice. Human eyes would see divine light, and human life would be enveloped in a cloud of God's presence that frightened the dickens out of the disciples. That presence is the great longing of humanity, I think. The existential longing of within our hearts and minds, that, that sort of yearning deep within that we can't sort of get our head around or understand. Such experiences encouraged pilgrims to journey to holy places. It called our spiritual ancestors to places in the desert and monasteries. It is why we persevere in prayer and study. That longing caused the disciples to seek a teacher. It is evidenced by the spiritual books that flood the shelves of our bookstores. And it is, at least in part, the reason why we show up at church. Week after week, we want to come face to face with what is real, what is reality, beyond our senses beyond what we know and we can hammer down that's more fluid because these experiences are so very different we don't often talk about the thin places do we it's not because those encounters are not real it is rather because they are too real too real for words too real to give adequate expression. And even if we did give adequate expression to it, it still doesn't meet the mark of what we really wanted to say or how it affected our lives. What we do know is we can never go back the way it was before. That moment of transformation now resides deeply within our DNA. And instead of talking about, describing, and explaining those experiences, we begin to live our lives within and through the mystery. And it's okay. Everywhere we go, we see, we hear, we smell, we touch, even taste the greatness and the wonder of the mystery that is with us. in new and unexplained ways and exciting ways. And in those moments, those thin moments, we are changed. We are transformed. We don't fully know how or why, but we know that something gigantic has happened. And somehow we have touched the hem of God. Let us pray. Revealing God, you bless us with your presence and wisdom. And we marvel at the wonders of your love that we can't seem to understand fully. You created a beautiful world that reveals your love. Jesus' presence with us has showed us how to live with compassion your Holy Spirit guides us on our way. Thank you. Thank you for opening our eyes to your presence each day. Help us to recognize you not only in the mountaintop experiences, but also in the everyday tasks in times of great change and challenge. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, 
much in this world needs transformation. Where there's violence, bring calm. Where there's poverty, send sustenance. Where there's confusion, bring wisdom. Where there's chaos, create order. Where minds and hearts and souls are troubled, bring comfort. Where pain is crippling, grant release. Move the hearts of the rich to share with those in need and call the powerful to act with justice for those at risk. Help us all to will to work for the well-being of the earth and to live with respect for this fragile place that we call home. And may, O oh God, we feel that mystery within our lives and may the world and its leaders feel the mystery tugging at their hearts and their lives and their souls so that peace might be a reality for all, that suffering might be something that is read about in the past and not a reality for today. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Timeless God, we pray for your church around the world and for our particular congregation as well. Give your people the energy to share, to shine. Wherever there, there is persecution, despair, or discouragement. Bless each congregation with wisdom and vision as we face the challenges in the world caused by this pandemic as we face the new challenges in this world caused by war and upheaval, renew our imagination and commitment to develop new forms of ministry and outreach for the days ahead. Gather us as a people again after months of distancing and to inspire us with greater delight in your mystery and the greater joy in seeking your presence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask all these things through Jesus the Christ who revealed your will to us through a revolutionary love. Again, a love that we don't fully understand and we try to get our heads around it, but it's just simply too big, too broad, too other than us. And yet, oh God, we are recipients. We've been touched by that love. And as we leave here today, oh God, may we share that love May we share peace within our communities, within our families, within our friends. And of course, a stranger. So let it be. Amen. Our concluding hymn, Christ has no body now but yours.
Now may God, may God now send us back down the mountain of worship. We have been changed. We can't be silent anymore. We have seen light of the world. Go and share the radiance of love with all whom you meet this day and in the days that follow. Go now in peace. Go now in love. Go now in the presence of the Holy. Thank you.